I was trying to cut this shorter because uh, it's long, but there's no music in the back of this, so let me... Thank you so much. Um, sorry that was super scuffed. I was trying to cut the intro a little bit shorter because I know we're starting uh, late today. I'm sorry about that. Um, our guest is coming to us all the way from Namibia. Um, so we're lucky to, to be with her today, but it's always a little difficult a little difficult uh, to do the communication um, from, from that far away. Sanex, thank you for the 18 months. Conch with 23.65 and Coca with $1.69. Thank you so much. Um, so today is our 49th episode of the Conservation Cast. Actually big time. Um, we are speaking with Kelsey Prediger today. Um, thank you for the, thank you for the subs. Kelsey is a research associate at the Namibia University of Science and Technology Biodiversity Research Center. Um, and she's secretary, secretariat of the Namibian Pangolin Working Group. Warber with $20. Thank you so much. Um, so she studied zoology and conservation biology in the US, but she's been in Namibia for the past four years. For the past two and a half years, Danza, thank you for the $20. For the past two and a half years, she's been the lead pangolin research researcher at the Africat Foundation. Um, and she's pursuing her master's in natural resource management. Um, focusing on the ecology of the of ground pangolins. There are eight species of pangolins, um, all of which are either considered vulnerable or critically endangered, I believe. Um, most of that, I assume, is because of... Hi, Dobbins. Um, because of habitat loss, but a big part of it is because uh, of wildlife trafficking. Um, a lot of people have said that pangolins are the most trafficked uh, wildlife in the world. We'll talk to Kelsey about whether or not that's true and why that's true. Uh, if you guys aren't super familiar with, with pangolins, not penguins, pangolins, um, they are the only mammal that's fully covered in scales. Those scales are for their own protection, but don't necessarily protect them from uh, wildlife trafficking. So Green Geeks with $25, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that today and, and about why that, uh, why that is, is pretty devastating to them as a species. Kelsey is also on the board of Crash Wildlife. That might sound familiar to you. Um, or thank you for the $40. All of these donations today are going directly to uh, Crash Wildlife. Dobbins, what did you just say? Do not. Cindy, thank you for the $5. Um, all of these donations today are going directly to Crash Wildlife. If that organization sounds familiar, it's because we've spoken with them before. If you guys remember James, um, canine anti-poaching, um, he had Puma, who's, who's his Weimaraner that he uses for, for anti-poaching, also in Namibia. Um, Crash Wildlife uh, stands for Conservationists Raising Awareness for Species and Habitats. They're an awesome organization. They raise awareness and donations for lots of causes. They do cheetahs, pangolins, rhinos, elephants, 
um, meerkats, they're, they're all across the board. And their big thing right now is they're raising money to build a rescue and research center uh, in Namibia. Jude, thank you for the $10. Um, so, a lot of our donations will be supporting that cause. You guys know that I'm a wildlife rehabilitator. Uh, the idea of them building um, a rehab center and a research center all the way over there is really, really cool. Um, so I hope that we're able to support that today. Zarita's with the $5. Tripod with the $35. Thank you so much. Um, so $185.34 already for Crash Wildlife. Um, in addition to that, Crash has a Kickstarter campaign right now um, to support that project of their, of their rescue and research center in Namibia. Um, if you do command pins, um, you can make a pledge for, for that Kickstarter if you're interested. They have some really, really cool soft enamel pins that they're, uh, that they're selling. Really, really neat art. I'll show you. It's this. Um, I've pledged for a pin already because I think that they're so cute. These are their pins. You can also get stickers. Um, and this is all to, to raise money for, for that center. So we'll talk more about that during the podcast, but there should be a command. It's in the title. Oh. Uh, okay, well, there will be a command. Um, other things for the podcast. Oh, it's command pin. It's command pin. My bad. Could you change that in the title, please? Um, I think I did pins in the title. So, the podcast lasts about an hour. Um, other things for the podcast, orders of business. Oh, it's pin or pins. <laughs> cool. Um, so if you have a question during this podcast, if you want to know something about pangolins that I'm not asking, um, you are welcome to ask a question. You do that by doing hashtag ask, um, followed by your question. Nothing fancy. That's it. It'll send it to a doc for me. Um, so I'll have that doc open and I can read questions to Kelsey, uh, as we go through. And... Dylan, thank you for the 1313. Um, perfect. Raman just did a perfect example there. So uh, if, if you're looking at how to ask a question, follow Side Raman's example. Um, there will also be a quiz at the end of the podcast. Yeah, Dobbins, whatever you want. Um, there's a quiz at the end of the podcast based on my conversation with Kelsey. Um, five questions, 20 seconds a question, no trick questions. It's just about, it's just about the podcast. Um, so if you win the quiz, if you're not already a sub to my channel, I'll gift you a sub. Uh, if you are already, um, sub to my channel, I'll gift you a sub to a channel of your choice. Um, or you can ask me to donate an additional $5 to crash today. Um, but that'll be at the end of the podcast. Um, I think that that's it. I'm trying to go through this intro kind of quick. I'm sorry that I'm talking kind of fast. Um, but Dylan, no, super with $20. Thank you. Okay, Dixie, good good with the questions. Side ramen, good with the questions. I will be back in a minute to talk to you about pangolins with Kelsey. Am I missing anything? Do I usually say something that I don't? Or that I didn't? Nope. All right. Let's do it. I'll see you guys in a minute. I forgot to the stinger. <clears throat> Okay, is it, is it working? Is yes, it, it can is. you see me? Okay, cool. All right, let's make sure that they can see you. Do, 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 do. Beautiful, wonderful. All right. 
Um, chat, let me know about the audio. Um, we did a test call, but let me know if there's an echo or something. Um, hi, Kelsey. Thank you so much for, for coming on today. Sorry. She had issues logging into Discord. I guess she had to do that, like, capture thing 15 times or something. <laughs> that was crazy. But thank you so much for, for coming on. I did, I did a short intro um, about you, about pangolins, about Crash. Um, but I would love for you to tell us about yourself and about um, Crash. We've raised two hundred and eighteen dollars so far um, for. Wow, that's amazing! Them. So yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. So I've been in Namibia for four years, and I am working in pangolin research and conservation. And I got involved with Crash um, because during my time here, I met Noel and. We all have similar similar goals in conserving um, endangered species as well as their habitat, and that's how I got involved with Crash. Um, and definitely, please check out the Kickstarter um, for the fundraiser to have a rehabilitation center here in Namibia. Um, that would be really helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I can talk for hours on Pangolin. So if you guys have, um, you know, directed questions or I can just keep teaching. I'm so sorry about that. Um, sorry. <laughs> when I talk, when I, when I start talking, my cat likes to come cuddle. <laughs> That's cute. Okay. Um, anyways, no, I can, I can talk for like ever about Pangolin. Um, I've been researching them for a long time. Um, I actually was involved with um, large carnivores, especially big cats, and um, I was working on my thesis in Namibia, and it didn't work out to do carnivores, and I realized um, no one is doing research in Namibia on pangolin, and they're the most trafficked mammal worldwide, and I thought, you know, okay, I don't want my thesis to just be a piece of paper. I want it to be something that gives back to conservation, and so... To do something on pangolin meant that even if I just do a thesis and I go back to the United States or somewhere else, that would be so valuable for the conservation of pangolin because nothing's been done in this country. Mm -hmm. And this is the most arid country out of their entire um, out of their entire range. So um, that's how I got involved with pangolin. And because there's such a need for it, um, it kind of just hooked me. And now here I am years later, still uh, researching and conserving pangolin. That's so neat. Um, can we start, let's start with them. You said that they're the most trafficked. Did you use that word? They're the most trafficked wildlife? Tra most trafficked mammal. Mammal. So why is that? What are they trafficked for? So um, there are eight species worldwide. There's four in Asia and four in Africa. And unfortunately, they are a large part of um, Eastern Asian culture. Mm -hmm. um, they are used in traditional Chinese medicine as well as eaten as a delicacy in China and Vietnam. I see. So all four species in Asia are critically endangered or endangered and that's because of the high level of poaching and trafficking that they've, the pressure that they've been under from these markets. Jeez. And um, now that these species are under such a threat and they're hard to find in Asia, they're turning to Africa to fulfill those markets. Um, and that, so that's, that's why they're the most trafficked mammal, but I can go specifically into, um, like I said, they're eaten as a delicacy. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the way that they're eaten is they must be killed live at the table. What? And so that's something that um, it's very sad. It's very shocking. It's illegal. They're protected under um, CITES Appendix 1, which is the same level of protection that rhino have. Mm. There's no trade allowed of the species, but um, it still happens illegally because it's been a part of the culture for so long. Right. Um, to eat a pangolin live at, the, at, at a table is considered a status symbol, so it's a way for people to show their wealth. And, um, you know, as pangolin are becoming more rare in Asia, um, they're turning to Africa. So additionally, as I mentioned, they're used in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, as far as I know, they're used in over 250 different medicines as well as raw, um, raw parts. And um, there's no actual medicinal 
value. There's nothing proven. Mm -hmm. um, the same with most traditional Chinese medicine. Right. And um, I can even touch on some current events. Um, in, in times of COVID, pangolin were considered to be a potential cause. There's no actual proof to that. Um, but in June this year, China passed a law that said pangolin are not allowed to be used in traditional Chinese medicine. Oh. And that's what they put out worldwide. Uh -huh. But if you look at the fine print, they only banned the use of raw parts of pangolin in traditional Chinese medicine. Oh. And at this point, um, I don't know the exact number, but it's over 230 medicines still use pangolin in their parts as an ingredient. So unfortunately, they're traded um, on a level such as that as rhino horn is. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, the pangolin scales are made out of keratin, which is just the same as our fingernails. Right. Um, their scales are super, super interesting. I'm going to pull up um, some pictures. I know you guys saw pictures in the intro, um, but they're such, such cool looking animals. Monkru, thank you for tipping $50. I'm sorry, $273. That's wonderful. Um, look how cool these are, you guys. Um, while I'm, while I'm looking at pictures, somebody asked, what is the role that they play in their ecosystem? So that's actually a really good question. Um, pangolin are actually quite valuable to the ecosystem for many reasons. Um, so the species that I work with is terrestrial. So it lives on the ground and it spends the days in burrows. Um, some of the other species are tree dwelling, um, so they don't have all the same effect. But at the end of the day, they all consume a large number of pests. They, they eat ants and termites only, mm -hmm. and these ants and termites can be considered pests because they eat a lot of organic matter that could be for livestock or, or wild, um, here we would say wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, so like here in Namibia, for example, Having a pangolin in your ecosystem, their favorite species of ants and termites are mostly harvesting species. So they're harvesting organic matter, especially grasses. And um, so having that pangolin there, there's a rough figure thrown out. It's estimated they can eat like 70 million ants and termites a year. So they're eating these, oh these pests that eat the grass for wildlife, but also livestock. Uh -huh. um, so I think, you know, this is something really important that we're trying to teach the local people here is actually having a pangolin is a good thing for you because it's it's killing the ants and termites that eat the food for your livestock. Mm -hmm. So they have a huge role in that aspect. But additionally, the terrestrial species, when they're digging, they're turning over the soil and that puts additional air into the soil, but it also turns um, seeds back into the soil so it can increase uh, plant germination as well oh how cool um, I had a picture pulled up of their tongue <laughs> it was a, a picture on Crash's um, yeah. Crash's Instagram that tongue is incredible this picture job yeah so um, yeah pangolin they're so interesting they're so unique they're pretty cool animals um, their tongue is actually as long as their body, not the tail, but the body. And so it's really interesting. They don't actually have a jaw. They don't actually have teeth. They just have one long sticky tongue. And the tongue is so long, it goes all the way down to the abdomen. And it has its own cavity where it's attached inside and it rests in a sheath. Um, and and um, when the tongue goes down the hole, it's sticky. They have a gland in the throat that produces a sticky saliva that the ants and termites can stick to. And so then when they ingest this, it goes down into the stomach. And the stomach is actually not a normal stomach that, um, that most people think of. It's more like a gizzard, more like a bird's stomach. Uh -huh. They don't have stomach acid. Um, they actually have a muscular stomach, and it functions like a gizzard. So they ingest stones and gravel. And inside of the stomach is also keratinous spines to help grind up the exoskeleton of these um, ants and termites to digest them. But additionally, what's been found is they're targeting species that have a chemical defense. They very much prefer um, a species of ant that produces a formic acid as defense. And this formic acid also is believed to be a chemical compound that helps break down 
the exoskeleton in the stomach of the pangolin. So in the rainy season, um, here in Namibia, over 90% of the time in the rainy season, that's the only species they eat. Wow, that's so interesting. I have never seen a tongue like that. I had a picture pulled up of like a side view of a drawing of that tongue. That is crazy. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And like when it comes out, it does this crazy curly thing. It's so flexible because what they do is they, they use their strong sense of smell to sniff out a nest. They prefer to target um, the larva and eggs and they open the nest up from the side. And so then you've got all the different tunnels that lead to different parts of the nest. And so that tongue is so flexible, it can just go this way or that way. And it just follows the nest to where it can access the eggs and the larva. And um, not only are the nests special because there's always a high density of, of ants and termites in general, but also the larva and the eggs give a high nutritional return compared to an adult that has an exoskeleton. Um, but generally speaking, um, they do not forage individuals on the surface. Mm -hmm. They they don't, you won't see them targeting um, surface active ants and termites. They specifically target the nest. And one of their favorite species I mentioned, um, the species I work, the, the pangolin species I work with, it, it varies across pangolin species. Um, but the ground pangolin favorite species in Namibia is actually a species that congregates in high densities at night mm -hmm. and they're active on the surface during the day mm -hmm. and so the pangolin are foraging at night and they have these high densities of ants and termites that they can feed on because they're all congregated in the nest um so it's it's quite interesting to see how they how they target their food because if they just went on surface active individuals you know they might get one or two or ten here and there but they actually target the nest to where there's thousands of adult individuals plus the larva and the eggs that's so cool um so are they all nocturnal or the species that you work with are then so the species i work with is predominantly nocturnal um their activity is completely dependent upon the temperature or environmental conditions okay. not 100 percent temperature but let's just say environmental conditions mm -hmm. um so in the winter months we will see some activity during the daytime because it's too cold for them at night. Mm -hmm. um, in a drought year, they're almost completely day active in the winter because they don't have enough body fat to stay warm. Um, but generally speaking, from about September to April or May, they're completely active at night. And like I said, it's more about the temperature than, um, than about the daylight or anything like that. Okay. Um, there are some species that are a bit more um, diurnal or active at day. Um, for example, the white belly pangolin and black belly pangolin, they are both um, living more in the rainforest treetops and they will be more active during the day. I'm pulling up a white belly pangolin here. Oh, they're smaller. Yeah, so the ones that live in the trees are like much smaller with long tails. The the wow. so the name of the species I work with is the Temminck's ground pangolin or Smutsia temminckii, and they're the second largest species of the eight. Um, they weigh anywhere from eight kilos to twenty or so. Um, here in Namibia, because we're in such an arid environment and food availability is less. Our maximum is about like 15 kilos, um, but I've heard the range goes up to like 18 or 20 in a place like uh, Zimbabwe or, or Tanzania. Um, but so here it's a little bit smaller. The largest species is the giant ground pangolin and they can get over 35 kilos. Wow, that's it's about 70, but, 70 But those pounds? species, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. So those species only live along the equator where there's a lot higher rainfall and a lot more um, prey availability or food availability. I see. So the species that I work with here is the only species to be adapted to such an arid environment. Mm -hmm. And they can occur in areas with as little as 250 millimeters of rainfall. Wow. Um, I want to say that's like 10 inches of rain a year, if I'm right. Years. 
24 millimeters to an inch. I've been, yeah, I've been typing in the conversions. It's been um, a while since <laughs> I've been on the American system. No, that's fine. Yours is better anyway. Um, okay, so we've had lots of questions come through chat. There have also been a couple more donations. Um, so we're at $328 SMK. And Choke Captain, thank you guys um, so much. So in addition to these donations, we've had lots of questions come through chat. Do you mind if we start on those questions? No, by all means, I'm happier to ask questions because I can talk for hours. So I'd rather talk about what people are interested in. <laughs> okay, for sure. Um, so Max, uh, one of the first questions we got was, is it true that pangolins are more closely related to cats and dogs than armadillos? It's true. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. So um, if you look at, um, you know, the genetic tree, pangolin actually have been around for over 60 million years, and they are much more closely related to modern day carnivores than actually other anteating species, including anteaters and armadillos. And their shared features is an example of something called convergent evolution. So they have similar features because they evolved to eat this, um, they evolved to eat ants and termites. So it actually, it actually has nothing to do with how related they are. It has all to do with evolution and evolving to eat ants and termites. Very cool. Max, thank you for that question. That's really interesting. Um, okay, and then... Max, well, Max also asked, how strong are their scales? So you said that they're made made up of keratin. Yeah, so they're actually, they're really strong. Um, they do have natural predators, but a healthy adult usually would survive an attack by a predator. Um, juveniles, their scales are quite thin, um, but it's it's interesting. So the adults, the older they get, the more the edge of their scale gets worn down on the edge mm -hmm. and it gets sharp like a razor. Oh, and yeah. so when a predator attacks them, they thrash around like this kind of, and will actually slice open the predator with the edge of their scales. I and um, that I'm, I'm, they can, when they get older, they get that sharp. I even had it where I was, I've never had a really violent pangolin. I like to think I put out positive energy and so they, they don't get angry or thrash around. Uh -huh. um, but I had it where I just moved my hand like this and it sliced my finger right open because it was so sharp like a razor. Wow. Um, but anyways, if you if you Google it, you can find videos of lions and leopards and hyena playing with the pangolin, picking them up even. And very often, if the pangolin just stays still and rolled tight, they survive because the predator will lose interest. Right. Um, I've had many pangolin who've lost a scale to a predator and the scales do not grow back. They do scar over, but usually they always heal. But a juvenile pangolin, the scales are very thin and very brittle and they can just break. So the bite from a hyena or a lion to a juvenile would be lethal. Oh. But an adult healthy pangolin, they don't easily break through the scales. They're very strong. Oh, I see. Um, much stronger than our fingernails um at some points they can get to be a couple millimeters thick the, the, at the center of the scale that's incredible um Schuler, thank you for the five dollars razor with 20 james with 10 so 363 dollars thank you um a couple people have asked how long they live for dixie was one of those people thank you Okay, yeah, that's actually a good question. So they're considered to be quite long lived. They, they're believed to be able to live over 20 years old. There was an Asian species in captivity in a zoo that lived to be, I think, 23 or 25. Wow. Um, in general, they don't live in captivity very well because they're used to eating a live diet mm -hmm. and not a captive diet. Um, but in the wild, easily they should reach over 15 years of age. Okay, very cool. Thank you for that question. And that's not what I expected. I thought it'd be a lot less. Um, okay, other questions that we, we have lots of questions about defending 
uh, them, how they defend themselves. But I think you just you just talked about that. Are there other ways that they defend themselves, or is it mostly just balling up and, and those scales? The really the only way they defend themselves is to roll tightly into a ball and thrash around. And sadly, that's why they're so easily poached, because they literally just roll up, mm -hmm. and then somebody picks them up and throws them in a sack or a box. Mm -hmm. Um, they have the capability to run away, but they're not, I mean, they're not that fast. It depends. Um, if you're in thick bush, they just run through the thorns, through the trees, through the grass, through the bushes. They can easily outrun me because I have to go around those things. Mm -hmm. But, um, in many cases, you know, if somebody approaches them, uh, they'll roll tight in a ball and just think that they're hiding. Right. Um, and then somebody can easily pick them up. Oh. They do have anal glands and they can release a scent. And it's believed they'll release like a scent in defense. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have a noise they can make, like a hissing noise. But they don't have teeth. They don't even have a jaw. Their, their, their actual jaw is actually just cartilage where the tongue just sits and goes in and out. Right. Um, so other than thrashing around with their sharp scales, there's no other defense that they have. Okay. Gosh, that's such a sad image of them just balling up. Um, okay, Foulish asked, why are their tails so long? Well, um, I mentioned earlier the tree-dwelling species have really long tails. And it's just like any other arboreal or tree dwelling species you have. They use those tails to hang onto the branches. So if they slip and fall, they're caught with their tail. Um, so they have these long, narrow tails. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you look at the terrestrial or land dwelling species, they've got more of a fat, long and wide tail. Um, it is mostly prehensile and the land dwelling species will use that tail to push themselves up a straight slope. They go on top of the mountains. Um, they do all kinds of things. Can you define prehensile, just in case there are people here that don't know what that means? Okay, sure, yeah. So prehensile is having the ability to grip. Um, so just like um, a giraffe's tongue is prehensile in a way, and um, you know, the tail of a lot of monkeys is prehensile. They can grab onto a branch. Let's see if I can find a picture of that. The black belly penguins are beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm pulling up pictures of those as well. Yeah, they're really pretty. Here's one in a ball. I would love to see one. I don't know that this is the best picture example, guys, but it's kind of, it's, he's using it there to almost like another limb to, to climb a tree. That's really neat. Um, okay, wonderful. Other questions that we've had come through. Um, Cole Soy asked, do penguins ever walk on two legs? So some species do. Uh, the species that I work with does walk on just two legs. Um, so that's considered to be bipedal. Um, so their front feet, they've got really sharp claws and if you think of kind of, they kind of look like a little T-Rex walking around uh -huh. um, and their pectoral muscles are made so they can rip open nests. So they walk on those two hind feet and they use their large tail as a counterbalance and um, sometimes they will, they, they'll use the front feet when they're foraging. Um, but generally speaking, if they're just walking, they only walk on their two back legs. Wow. It, it's crazy to think that they're balanced walking like that. <laughs> That's so neat. Well, they've got this big tail in the back uh -huh. and then their body in the front and it just balances out. That's so cool. Um, health just tipped $50. Thank you so much. Um, and with his donation, Thank he you. asked, uh, he or she asked how... Has climate change affected the habitat and distribution of penguins? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, um, they said, how has climate change affected the habitat and distribution of pangolins? So that's actually an interesting question um, because Namibia is on the arid side of their distribution. Um, generally speaking, we have had some severe drought, which is not necessarily climate change. 
Um, but as climate change is affecting the world, um, desertification is happening. And Namibia has the number of deserts. Um, we have these huge expanses of desert where about, I think it's something crazy, is like hundreds of meters every year are further desertifying. And so with climate change happening, we're most likely going to see this rainfall gradient shift. Mm -hmm. um, so in the drought that we had 2018, 2019 here, very sadly, 50% of the individuals I studied died because there was not enough rainfall. Oh, geez. Um, in other countries where there's more rainfall, they might not have had deaths, but they're having, you know, the, the big problem is with little rainfall, the prey availability is lower. Mm -hmm. um, so it affects, you know, pangolin worldwide when there's not the normal rainfall happening. And it's quite devastating. We didn't have a single pup survive the 2018, 2019 winter drought. Um, so drought is one thing, climate change is another thing, but in some cases they are tied to one another. And so, as I mentioned, as the, as the climate change is, is affecting rainfall, um, it's possible we could sh see a shift in their range because their range is completely dependent on there being enough rainfall for their prey. Got it. Um, okay, so a lot of it, a lot of that rainfall being dependent on their prey. Vokan asked, yeah, how do they drink since, Vokan asked how do they drink since they have no jaw? So is it more about their prey? Yeah, that's a funny them? question. So, so they actually will drink with their tongue and just like, so they could drink for a really long time to get water. Um, but the species that I work with, the Temex ground pangolin, is water independent. They get all of the moisture content they need from their prey. If they're presented with water, they might drink, um, but they don't necessarily need to. In the winter months, there's very often no standing water for them to drink from, but they'll get enough moisture out of their prey. Um, but they do love the rain. They love to take mud baths. They love to roll in dung. Um, and they will drink from water when it's when it's presented to them. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't need to. Okay. Um, I also, I had this, this video playing um, while you were talking about the, the drought um, of, I guess it's called a pup then, the young. Yeah, they're called pups. I can't believe that they're able to ride on the back like that or how they how they maintain grip it's it reminds me a lot of an opossum but opossums are super grabby this i mean there's there's no way well, I, could, <laughs> I could do this well it goes back it goes back to the prehensile tail mm -hmm. so they actually grip onto the mom's back with the tail and then their two front legs so it's kind of like a tripod. They're like hooked on with uh -huh. their front legs and then the tail grips on. And I've actually seen it where um, the pup was knocked off by a branch and the mom immediately stopped. And it was just this teeny little pup. And it just uses its tail to push itself to get back up on top of mom. Wow. Um, also, chat look at the way that it walks away and that, that it's really is using those back two legs only that is incredible what a what a cool creature um okay blet to 1182 um thank you so much that brings us to 431 dollars and 20 cents um thank you guys so much if you're just getting here there are, uh what about about 21 people 2100 people here um so we're talking to Kelsey Prediger today. Um, she researches pangolins in Namibia. So it's late for you. What time is it for you? Like eight, almost nine? It's almost 9 p.m. here. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's dark outside. I don't know if you can tell because I've got this reflective glass, but yeah. No, we can't It's quite tell. dark outside. I, that's what I, I told her on the test call. When we talked to James, we could barely see him the whole time. So this is great. Um, I tried to turn on all the lights I could, so I'm not looking like it's nighttime. No, it's it's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Kelsey is on the board uh, at Crash Wildlife. That's where your donations are going directly to today. The PayPal is hooked up uh, to to theirs. So um, Crash, 
stands for um, Conservationists Raising Awareness for Species and Habitats. They do lots of work for lots of different species, giraffes, rhinos, elephants, um, pangolins, that's what we're talking about today. Um, and they're also doing a Kickstarter campaign right now to raise money for their research and rescue center um, that they're hoping to build in Namibia. Um, you could find that by doing command pin or command pins uh, if you'd like to go support that campaign. Um, but there's that. Kelsey also um, is a student at Namibia University of Science and Technology Biodiversity Research Center and Secretariat of the Namibian Pangolin Working Group. Um, and is the lead pangolin researcher at Africa Foundation. So lots of very cool stuff. Um, so lead pangolin researcher, what, what, is the, what is the primary research that you guys do? Are you guys using, um, are you using trackers? Are you uh, surveying populations? What, what does it look like for you guys out there? Yeah, so um, basically my research um, started with just my thesis project. Um, which is nearly complete. I'll be submitting it in the next month or so. Um, and the focus originally was to look at the ecology of ground pangolin focused on areas that can benefit trafficked pangolin. So I easily forget to mention this because I've been working in the field so long. Um, but very often in these African countries, we get, and Asian countries as well, equally, um, the police will see seize live pangolin. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, they can just pick up a pangolin and throw it in a sack. Right. Um, you know, sadly with rhino, they have to be killed to harvest the horn. But here, you know, with pangolin, they roll into a ball, people put them in a sack, and very often the police will seize them alive. Okay. So quite regularly, it's it's very sad. These pangolin get seized alive, we never know how long they've been held by their poachers. It could have been days, it could have been weeks. As I mentioned, pangolin are mostly water independent. They get their moisture from um, the prey that they eat. And so very often they're in like a very unhealthy state. They need rehabilitation and then they need to be released again. And, you know, generally speaking, pangolin are quite territorial and we don't know where these trafficked pangolin come from in the country. So we have to make a choice on where do we release these trafficked pangolin to give them the best chance at survival, fully knowing that where we release them most likely will have some sort of resident population. And so um, initially I sought out to answer some of the questions as, you know, what is the, what is the amount of space that they need to survive? Mm -hmm. What is their home range? What is their territory? And how does that vary from male to female? And then additionally, we wanted to look at, you know, what species of ants and termites are they eating? And what types of burrows are they using? So we could go into a site and say, this seems like an, an ideal habitat to release a pangolin that's been under all this stress and trauma and rehabilitation to maybe give it the best chance at survival. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where things started. Um, but it kind of snowballed from there because no one else is doing this research in Namibia. Um, there is some research being done in South Africa, a little bit in Zimbabwe, um, but on the species, most of the research was done in the 1990s and very little has been done since. Mm -hmm. They're not an easy species to study. Um, so we take in all the data, everything we can um, anything we can. So I've got camera traps out now. We try and monitor um, births and the nursing and, you know, gestation period, different things like that, mating behaviors, social behaviors, um, feeding ecology, spatial ecology, anything and every, everything. We're just basically sucking up all the data that we can and, um, yeah, basically doing whatever we can because it's also valuable. I also take body weights and measurements throughout the year to see how the body weight fluctuates over the rainy season, over the drought. Um, all of these things are so valuable because they are so little researched. Okay, thank you so much. Um, James tipped $10, Anonymous with $10, Nun with $30, Danny with $10. Um, we're very close to our $500 goal, we're at 496. 
Um, thank you guys for, for those donations. Um, Danny, with his donation, asked a question. He said, how long is their gestation period? The gestation period is about five months. They're considered to be a um, slow reproducing species because they only have one pup per year. The pup will stay with the mom and nurse for the first four to five months. Wow. And then after that, they, um, they usually stay in the mother's home range or the natal range where they were born for about a year before they disperse into a new home range. Okay. Um, so they reproduce really slowly. Yeah, that's unfortunate um, for, for conservation. Crowe, thank you for the five. Uh, for the five dollars that got us to five hundred, um, so five hundred and one dollars. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's do a couple more questions um, that people have asked. Oh, this is an interesting one. Uh, Dodge asks, "Do their tongues ever get bitten by the insects they eat, or are their tongues too tough?" So it's kind of funny. The their preferred species, as I mentioned, mentioned isn't. Uh, a species, a formic acid species. They're also very aggressive. Um, the common name is the pugnacious ant. And so they really like to bite. So their tongues get bit, their faces get bit. I've even seen it where um, I saw a pangolin with something black on the chest and I thought it was a tick. And it was actually the head of an ant. So the mandibles oh. had attached to the skin and never let go and the body fell off. Um, so they do eat really aggressive species, um, but their tongue is also very tough. It can handle it. Ouch. <laughs> that, that sounds terrible, but that's, that's neat. Um, thank you for that question. I think there are other people probably thinking the same thing. Um, okay, here's a question I, I get quite often of, of people that are interested uh, in working with animals, and my, my viewer base is relatively young, um, so... Voon asked, for someone interested in studying conservation biology in college, what are some of your tips for getting into conservation and research during or after college? I have to say that um, the more experience you get, the better chance you have. I know it's really competitive out there. And I mean, if I tell you my background, you'd be like, what? I've been a veterinary assistant. I've taught um, I've taught zoo classes at schools. I've also been a zookeeper. I've worked in rehabilitation. I've worked in um, uh, sanctuaries and release. I've worked in um, wildlife breeding programs to supplement wild species programs. So I would say the best thing you can do is start volunteering, even, even if it's just cats and dogs, but start getting involved in, in wildlife and in animals and engage yourself. I know, um, you know, I actually, even after I graduated with my bachelor's, I volunteered for two years um, doing different positions in conservation to get where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a really great, you know, competitive academic program, you can move from your bachelor's straight into a master's research program. Um, but I decided to take some, I, I took a few gap years to really decide what my focus was. And so I think the more experience you get is also good for you as a person because it helps you figure out what you want to do. I was actually studying pre-veterinary medicine on a track to do exotic wildlife veterinary medicine. And then I started getting involved with different internships and NGOs and projects and zoos. And I realized I actually really want to help the bigger picture. And so it, I think, you know, we all love wildlife but we all fall into the picture in a different place based on who we are. So you need to look at, you know, what really do you enjoy? And you can only find that out by doing it. So just um, get involved, volunteer, you know, do as many extracurricular activities you can out in nature with wildlife, with animals, and see what makes you happy. And, you know, then it will all fall into place. Follow the open doors. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, Locke, thank you for changing that. Uh, Gwenny tipped $5 and Tack tipped $5. Thank you guys. Um, okay, so we only have a couple minutes, so it's it's kind of a similar question, but um, I always ask it to my guests at the end. 
Um, Knights, thank you for the $10 donation. Um, so if there are people here that care about pangolins or maybe care about them more after this podcast, have a soft spot for them, but are not necessarily studying conservation biology um, or, you know, not out in Namibia uh, doing the work on the ground, how can they support pang pangolin conservation uh, the best? So that's a great uh, question. Um, you know, I always tell people one of the most important things with pangolin is awareness. So many people today still don't know what a pangolin is or what a pangolin looks like. And if we can just get every person, I mean, just think about it. Almost every person, I would like to say every person you ask knows what a rhino looks like. Mm -hmm. But pangolin are poached in higher numbers than rhino. And I bet you over 50% of the population doesn't even know what a pangolin looks like. So just spreading awareness about what pangolin are, why they're important for the ecosystem, and why they're so threatened. And you know, just spreading that awareness is already a really positive step in the right direction. Just for people to know what a pangolin is and to understand how trafficked they are is a start. Um, and I think that's one of the most you know, the most meaningful things we can do is to start spreading awareness because you start with awareness and then it turns into education and outreach. And, you know, I think that's definitely the most important thing is to raise the level of awareness on the critical status of pangolin. Perfect. Um, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, so for those of you who have donated, thank you for that. Um, for those of you who haven't or are not able to, um, that, that awareness, like she said, is super important. So if you've stayed here uh, throughout this podcast to watch and to learn, that means a lot. So thank you so much. Um, Choke tip $10 and Fernie tip $20. Um, so that's gotten us to $552. Thank you guys for all your questions today. Um, we're about out of time here. But Kelsey, is there anything else that you want to talk about or mention before we close up? Well, we're wrapping up. So I... Like I said, I think I said the most important thing is just keep raising awareness. You know, any post you see, please share it. We just need more people to know about pangolin and the plight of the pangolin. Um, like I said, I can talk hours about how amazing and interesting they are. Um, they're such unique creatures. And it's, I do have to say, getting to know them quite well, it's devastating because they're one of the shyest, gentlest creatures um, they they can be so terrified of people. And as I mentioned, they've been around for about over 60 million years. And only since people entered the picture are, are they threatened. Um, like I said, they virtually have almost no predators today because um, they have such a protective defense with their scales. So if we can continuously raise awareness, make people aware of how threatened they are, and continue to spread the word and raise funds to conserve them. That's the best thing anybody can do. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Kev with 15, Sketty with five. So we're at $572. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do an outro and our, our podcast quiz, but I will send you, um, I'll send you on WhatsApp the, the final donation amount so that you know, but thank you so much for, for coming on today. I know it's on the later side for you. Um, I appreciate you downloading uh, Discord and figuring all that out for us. This was really, really great. Thanks for having me, and thanks, everybody, for joining in. Um, I appreciate it, and the pangolin appreciate it even more. That's awesome. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. I will be in touch with you very soon. Cool. Thanks, guys. All right. Have a good day. For me, it's a good night. Yeah, good night. <laughs> all right, bye. <laughs> Bye. Pangolins, hooray. Um, I am really, I'm, I'm sorry about the video today, uh, chat. Her audio luckily didn't cut out, I don't think at all. Um, but part of the reason why I was pulling up pictures so often is because I know that her video is just constantly cutting out, but uh, I think that's just because of the location. Um, so it was good though, we got to see lots of pictures. Um, so <laughs> those, those good, uh, Phoenix, thank you for the $30. Um, I also appreciate you guys being understanding about that in the chat. I didn't see a bunch of people complaining about, um, about the video. So I do appreciate that. It makes my job a little bit less stressful. 
Lots of really good questions today. Um, thank you for asking them. I learned a lot. I, I, my favorite thing I think from today was learning about their tongue and how that works. That's like the craziest. I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't that. Um, <laughs> so Kelsey's wonderful. Um, I'm super glad that, that she got, uh, that she got to come on today and that we got to raise more money for crash. Um, the idea of, please don't, Sorry, I'm talking to Ori. Um, the idea of them uh, building out a research and rehabilitation center in Namibia is absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I think I have a lot of faith in them. I think they can make a lot of a difference over there. So uh, again, if you would like to support that specific that project, um, you can do command pin or command pins um, and go pledge for them. You also get really cute pins and uh, stickers if you do that. I've done it. I'm very excited. Um, Zach, thank you for the $15. Um, yeah, so wonderful organization. Uh, wonderful species. Thank you, Top Shelf. Welcome. I don't know if you're just showing up, but true. So, quiz time. Yeah? Are you ready? All right. People claps in chat for Chuck, who is the newest member of our production team, um, who writes our quiz questions for us. Also, I did have a call with uh, QuizKit the other day, um, so it's a really big part of our podcast, and they've noticed that it's a big part of the podcast, and they appreciate us using it, so we're, we're going to be getting to work with them um, in the future. I'm very excited about that. Um, so give me a couple minutes here to set up the quiz. The way that it works uh, is it's five questions, 20 seconds per question. It's based off a point system um, and you get points by answering questions correctly and quickly. Um, so you gotta click really fast uh, to get the most points. Uh, whoever gets the most points at the end of the quiz, if you're not already a sub to my channel, I will gift you a sub to my channel. If you are already subbed, I will gift you a sub to a channel of your choice, any channel on Twitch, or you can ask me to donate an additional $5 directly to Crash today. We're at $617.18. Um, so, no, ramen, I <laughs> don't. Um, all right. Do command quiz if you want to know how to set it up um, for your device. You can do it on mobile, you can do it on your computer, Android, iOS, whatever. Um, I'll be back in a couple minutes. I just need to copy paste, set it up, whatever. Give me like two minutes. I forgot it was in slow-mo. I put it in slow-mo for the pangolin video.
What's up? I muted the wrong thing. Okay, here we go. Um, quiz has been created. Uh, I will read the quiz questions to you um, before they show up on your screen. You need to click enable access. Loco with a hundred dollars. Pangolins, hypers, Loco, thank you for the hundred dollar donation. We've had lots of small donos come in today. Um, I really appreciate that they come from lots of different places, but the big donos um, a lot of times carry this podcast. So thank you so much for that. That's amazing. I appreciate it. Um, you need to click manage access. You need to allow access on your device so that I know what your username is for this quiz. Otherwise, um, you can't win because I want to know who you are. Um, here we go. The first question, it'll, it'll show up in a second. Earth, thank you for the $10. Very nice message too. I appreciate that. Earth Eclipse. Okay. The first question it'll show up in a second is how many species of pangolin are there in Africa? In Africa. In Africa. Not in total. Stop saying the answer in chat. What are you doing? That's not how you participate in the quiz. Are there eight species in Africa? Are there four species in Africa? Are there 10? Or is there only one? Sorry, Brandon. Locke thinks that there are seven in Africa. He is incorrect uh, because the correct answer is four. How many species total? Chat. Cindy got it, Squid got it, Danny got it, Jazz got it, Dixie got it, Green Geeks got it, Or got it, well done, eight, eight total. The correct answer is four. 301 people got that right. Who got it right the fastest? Anybody? Contestant number 887. Followed by Simon Says Go Crazy. And then GM. Well done. All right. The next question is, what are pangolin scales made of. Axel, thank you for the $7.19. Are they made of mud? Are they made of diamonds? Are they made of ivory or keratin? I see lots of easy claps in the chat. Choke tipped another $20. Choke with a bunch of donations today. Thank you so much. Diamond scales, mud scales. <laughs> the correct answer uh, is keratin, which is the same stuff that our fingernails are made out of. 356 people got that right. Holy cow. But who got it right the fastest? Loco, let's go. Loco followed by James, followed by Cinny. That puts somehow Funky Erdy in the lead. Followed by TSB and GM Cairo. Okay, the next question is, what role do pangolins play in their ecosystem? Are they an apex predator? Are they pest control? Are they an indicator species or do they have no use in their environment? Johnny, thank you for the $5. Apex predator. <laughs> um, no, the correct answer is that they're great pest control. What was the number she, they can eat like, did she say 7 million? Seven, did she say 70? What did she say? 70 million ants a year. Yeah. Okay. The correct answer is pest control. 276 people got that right. Uh, 
59 people said that they're an apex predator. Um, probably missed the podcast. But that'd be sick. Um, oh, Adeline got that right the fastest, then Sneak, then Ivory. But oh, oh, now Oh, Adeline is in the lead, followed by Ivory. So Oh, Adeline has pulled ahead. Um, the next question is, what is the main reason all eight pangolins... Wait. All eight pangolin species are endangered or vulnerable. So what is their main threat um, for, for the eight species? Is it predators? Is it a lack of food? Is it wildlife trafficking? Or is it that they are endangered smile? Three, two, one. Aw, oh, he got an ad. I'm sorry. Okay, Dobbin. Sorry, our college professor. Meh. This quiz is for children. <laughs> the correct answer is wildlife trafficking. That's 314 people that got that correct. Um, it's not supposed to be a hard quiz, Dobbins. It's for fun, okay? Space Voyage got that, Space Voyage got a perfect score, 20k, then Or, then Earthbound. Oh, Adeline is still in the lead though, Space did not pull up even with a perfect score, Ivory is in second, Dagger is in third, this is the last question, will somebody pull ahead of Oh, Adeline, and please pull ahead of Ivory. Question number five is what age are pangolins expected to reach in the wild? Do they reach 30 years in the wild? 50 years? 15 years? Or five years? Koopa Steve with $77 and 77 cents. Koopa, thank you for the donation. Misclicked Sag, misclicked people clap. The correct answer is 15 years in the wild, but they had a pangolin in captivity that lived to be 23, I think is what she said. Um, long lifespan, 23 or 24. Um, the correct answer is 15 years in the wild, 269 people got that correct. Um, well done. Who got it right the fastest for this question? Switch it down. Got a perfect score on that question, but oh, Adeline has won the quiz this week. Oh, Adeline, where are you? Are you subbed? Oh gosh, I don't even know what color to look for. Five to the org. You got it. You got it. I can just do this with my panels because their PayPal is hooked up to my account. I probably have to do two factor, hold on. Um, All right. Mockeroo, thank you for gifting. Um, okay, I am donating the $5 now. I am sorry that we started a little bit late today. Um, no, not $10 extra, I've, I've, I've uh, done just fine this week. Um, there we go. Choke tipped a... Choke with another donation. 38 dollars. Only 122nd, I'm slow. But let's go for 900. Choke got 122nd place in the quiz. Oh, what's up? Um, but he is a good sport. <laughs> and has gotten us to our 900 dollar goal. Um, Alex, thank you for the $5. I appreciate that. 
um, $905 today for, for Crash Wildlife, which is a wonderful organization. I, I love having uh, organizations on multiple times. I like building a relationship with, with organizations that I support and that I respect. So uh, very cool that we got to have them back. Next week is our 50th podcast episode. Big time. Um, so it's going to be special. We're going to have a guest on that we have had before. But I'm not going to tell you who it is. Uh, all I'm going to tell you is that... Well, I don't know how to give you a hint without spoiling it. Should I just spoil it? Without telling you who it is, but everyone will probably know if I tell it. <laughs> Why not? Um, our, 50th podcast episode, our 50th podcast episode, we're going to uh, get to meet lots of animal friends. So... I thought that that would be a really cool podcast to do for the 50th. They're always really fun. Um, and I think it's a good way to, to bring it all back to what we do these podcasts for. Um, I think it's special for, for you guys. It is absolutely not Dobbins, no. Um, you're joking about the teaching thing, right? Like, you're joking about the Zoom thing, right? <laughs> he said, I can't repeat what he said because this is a podcast. <clears throat> Okay, um, so thank you for being here for the 49th episode of the Conservation Cast. Um, I love this podcast, Twitch is an untapped reservoir for doing good, and I'm so glad to be a part of it. You know, Matt did a media interview. Are you serious? Okay. Hi, Dobbins class. Um, Matt did a media interview on television, and he said Twitch is an untapped reservoir for doing good on his interview. Because it was a make-a-wish thing. And they're like, wow, like you really use Twitch to do such such wonderful things. And he's like, yeah, Twitch is an untapped reservoir for doing good. <laughs> I'm standing right off camera. I was like, you did not. <laughs> um, and then he also said that, he was like, yeah, I do a podcast every Friday about the environment. Check it out. I don't know. He just doesn't take anything seriously. Scotty, thank you for the 419. Um... $910. Even. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm trying to think of the things that I need to tell you today. Big time. Ori made progress yesterday for the first time in nine days. <laughs> I was, when, I, when I tell you guys that this is the slowest I've ever made progress with a bird of prey, I mean the slowest. Um, but there was progress yesterday. Uh, so I think I've had him for nine days. Uh, maybe it's ten days today. Um, he is just a shy boy. He, Ori, for those of you who don't know, is my peregrine prairie falcon hybrid. Um, he was donated to, uh, donated as an educational ambassador because I work at a wildlife rehab center. Um, he's not, he doesn't have perfect vision, so one of his eyes is a little bit scuffed. That's why he was a donation. Um, but he's under my falconry license, so I'll be flying him for his enrichment, uh, and for mine, I suppose. Uh, thank you for the dollar. I appreciate that. We all appreciate that. Um, but anyway, so he's been super, super shy this entire time. Um, I have not been able to get him on my glove. But yesterday, he stepped up onto my glove to eat his entire meal. And he ate the whole meal on the glove. My arm was very tired. But I didn't care. <laughs> Look at him go. That's huge for him, chat. It is huge that he stepped up like that. Because every time I have to pick him up, because I need to weigh him every day. I hood him and weigh him every day. Every time I pick him up, he violently baits like I'm trying to end his life. He's like, don't touch me. <laughs> so, um, it was really exciting that, that he stepped up uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm going... On Monday now uh, to to go hunting with his uh, duck hunting with his previous owner and his peregrine falcons um, so that'll be really cool that that man is also yeah my sponsor now um, because I'm restarting my apprenticeship my falconry apprenticeship in Texas um, so that'll be really fun um, tonight uh, I, I really don't know what people have announced for tonight I know that you guys know that we've all gotten corona tests um, and 
I know you know there's something happening. I'm pretty certain it's being streamed. Melina told us that you're all going to the house at 5. Right, yeah, so 5. Um, we're we're going to be... Either Soda or Nick will stream it. Great. So I'll host it on my channel. Um, I'll put it I'll put it in my Discord as well because I don't know whose channel it's going to be on and I don't know what time they're starting. Bro Sauce with $54. Wait, no. Bro Sauce with $89. I'm sorry. I read your name. Bro Sauce with $89 for 1K. He said, a cool 1K sounds nice. Dude. Bro sauce, 54. Thank you so much. Um, that's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so for tonight, I'll, I'll put it in my Discord. Um, you, can, you can join my Discord, um, and then I'll host it on this channel as well. Uh, we've all gotten... We all got our corona tests on Tuesday, and we're getting another one tonight. Um, Matt and I are negative. We got our results back on Wednesday morning. So one test down, one more to go, um, and then we'll be at Nick and Molina's tonight. So how was the test? Honestly, it doesn't hurt. Um, it was a no swab, but I, I didn't like it. It just, it, I don't know, it just, the, the, the idea of it kind of freaks me out, but don't let that stop you from getting a test. I have the lowest pain tolerance um, out of anyone I've ever met in my entire life, I'm just a baby, so it's really not that bad. Everyone should get a test if you can. It's good stuff. Um, so that's tonight. Also, I got all new truck tires literally yesterday, and one of them is dead flat this morning, so I have to get another new tire today. 200 bucks a tire. And this one is flat this morning. Um, but I'm not paying for it because I got a warranty. Did you pay for the test? No, Twitch did. Panda, thank you for the dollar. Okay. It was nice, actually. Twitch had EMTs come to our house. Um, so... All right. I think that's it for the podcast. I don't think I'm missing anything to talk about. Um, there is any horror streams coming soon. Um, yeah, Greek, Greek wants to learn all kinds of stuff. Greek wants to learn hockey and horseback riding. And so he's done whenever I just have to tell him when. Um, but he'll, we'll probably do, do a horse stream soon. Um, Housewives is tomorrow, yes, um, I'm not sure what time, but I'll tell you in the Discord. I think last week it was supposed to be scheduled for 3 p.m. CT, I think, so I assume it'll be the same time, um, but don't take my word for that. Keep an eye out on Twitter, um, and in my Discord, and in the Housewives Discord also. There is a Housewives Discord, so you can check that out. Wantep, uh, thinks that he can say whatever he wants because he's a partner now, congratulations. Um... I'll go ahead and host Russell today, and then I'll see you guys on stream tonight. Uh, I'll raid Russell. I'll see you on stream tonight. Um, why did Matt just message me? I need your help. Can I use your PS5? I'm going to assume that was to the wrong person. Conch, thank you for the dollar eighteen. Okay, I'm gonna play the outro and then I'm gonna host Russell. I just gotta find the outro. Um Thank you guys for watching today. You couldn't find your video. Okay, weird. No outro. Thank you guys for watching today. The viewership uh, on the podcast has been increasing steadily, um, and it means a lot to me. I really, really appreciate that. 
Um, I've talked to a couple a couple people recently about the podcast that I respect a lot, um, and to have people that I respect be impressed with with the podcast itself, um, the viewership, the the use of the platform, is really 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 cool. Um, so I'm really proud of it. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm really proud of it, and and I love that that we do it, and I love that there are people here that enjoy it as well. It means a lot. So, thank you for watching. Thank you for donations. But if you're not donating, if you can't, which is totally fine, um, I just appreciate you guys listening in. And um, like Kelsey said, that, that awareness piece is so massively important as well. Uh, do command pins if you want to check out that Kickstarter. The pins are really, really cute. And the stickers are really cute. It's like 10 bucks to pledge. Um, I already did it. I'm really excited to get it. I'm going to put it on my IRL backpack leaked. I'm probably going to get an IRL backpack, um, but probably not until December or January. Um, but yeah, so we have that to look forward to as well. Uh, I'm going to suck it up and figure out how to use it because it's just necessary. I IRL more, at least once a week, like I got to step it up. Um, so that'll be cool, but all right. That's it. Go say hi to Russell. Sorry about the outro. I don't know why it's not working, but next time. Appreciate you guys.